Hey, this is Stephen from Wild Stuff. Welcome to the show. In this video, I'll be discussing my experiences using a Skywatcher Star Adventure tracking mount for the first time as a beginner astrophotographer. In particular, I want to talk about how my expectations of a mount like this differed from the actual reality of using one, and I'll share some tips and pointers and the common mistakes that I made that I wish I'd been aware of a week ago that you might find helpful if you're thinking of taking the plunge into astrophotography especially if you're in the Southern Hemisphere like me. So I've been lucky enough to be able to borrow a Star Adventurer Pro Kit uh, from a friend for a few weeks so that I could try before I buy. Thanks to Yola for the loan. You can check her out on Instagram here. I also want to reiterate that even though I'm a reasonably experienced photographer and I know my way around my camera quite well, I'm still a complete newbie when it comes to this kind of astrophotography. For those of you who are wondering what a star tracking mount actually is, it's basically a slowly rotating mount for your camera. Most deep space objects like distant galaxies and nebulae, they're far too faint to see with the naked eye, so they require a long exposure with the camera to be able to show them up. But if you just plopped your camera onto a regular tripod and tried to take a long exposure, uh, it's just going to be ruined by the rotation of the Earth. So the idea is that if you can line up the axis of rotation of this mount with either the north or south celestial pole, this will rotate at the same rate as Earth, but just in the opposite direction. And that will keep the camera pointed at a fixed position in the sky, allowing you to do a long exposure without it being ruined by star trails or motion. So I've had about three or four sessions over the last few weeks with this when the skies have been clear and I've learned a few things the slow and frustrating way that would have been very helpful if I'd known beforehand. So the first mistake I made was to set it all up here in the living room complete with camera and lens just like you see. Picked it all up, took it outside and expected to start shooting with it straight away. There's a very important step missing when you do it like that and that is polar alignment. Polar alignment is the process of lining up the mount's axis of rotation with the north or south celestial pole. And to do so, you need to be able to see through a small viewfinder which is built into the center of the mount. So you need to do that before you mount the camera. And polar alignment is definitely not an easy process at all, especially if you're a beginner, literally fumbling around in the dark, having never seen it done before. The reality of getting started with one of these is that you're going to spend more time setting it up and aligning it than actually using it. The second thing to be aware of is that even though my regular everyday tripod is plenty strong enough to hold a setup like this, it's absolutely useless if you can't get down comfortable and low enough to be able to see through the built-in poloscope. The poloscope isn't like a camera with a nice convenient tilty flippy touchscreen. You've got to physically get yourself down there and spend quite some time peering through the scope, twiddling with dials until you get the alignment just right. So if you can get hold of one, a bigger sturdy tripod like one of these will make life much easier for you. I like to set it to a height just right for kneeling and wear my motorbike jeans with the built-in knee pads. So the next mistake I made, even once I'd fully read the manual and gotten my head around the polar alignment process, was expecting to be able to look up into the night sky and see the necessary stars for a polar alignment with the naked eye. Here in the Southern Hemisphere, they're called Polaris Australis and the Octans constellation. And the reality is that they're so small and faint and dim that Either you won't be able to see them at all, or you will be able to see them, and you'll also be able to see every other star around them, and you won't have a clue which one's which. On my first session with it, I eventually gave up trying to find them at all, and just took a rough educated guess and locked it in and hoped for the best. And this was the result of a 20 second exposure of Orion. That was still exciting, being my first ever nebula photo, but it really wasn't worth showing anyone. So with a little advice from some of the astronomy groups that I'm in, I decided to take a more scientific approach rather than just waving the poloscope around in the air all willy-nilly. I headed down to Bunnings and bought a level protractor to measure the angle of the star adventure amount. According to the planetarium app I use called Stellarium, the south celestial pole is just short of 33 degrees of vertical elevation from the horizon, which is easily measured out with the protractor. Next, I dug out my old hiking compass to make sure the mount was facing correctly in terms of north and south. Now bear in mind that a compass will point to the magnetic north pole which is not the same as the geographic north. So I use this website called magneticdeclination.com to enter my specific location and it told me the angle of difference between geographic and magnetic north. Then I was able to tweak the star adventure amount to be aligned pretty close to true geographic north and south. 
So with the combination of the protractor and the compass, I was able to get the mount facing pretty close to the South Celestial Pole before it even looked through the, the built-in finder scope. So then once I did actually look through the scope, it only involved very minor adjustments to get it lined up correctly. Also bear in mind, the view through the built-in polar scope is completely upside down. If you're not aware of this when you're trying to look through it, you're going to have a very difficult time. Ask me how I know. And my next piece of advice is to keep it simple to start with. Resist the urge to break out the big guns straight away. As awesome as a 600mm lens like this is, it requires a damn near perfect polar alignment and if you're trying to use a lens like this while you're still learning a mount like this, it's going to be a lot more frustration than it's worth. A smaller lens like this 55 to 250mm zoom lens is a much better place to start and is still more than capable of producing good shots. Pick an easy target too to begin with. I started with the Orion Nebula because it's big and bright and easy to find. Initially I had these grand ideas that I was going to be shooting the Horsehead Nebula to begin with, but uh, then I discovered just how dark and faint and small it was, so I realised that's going to take a lot more practice, a much more accurate polar alignment, and I'm really going to have to brush up on my image stacking and processing skills. Which brings me to my final point, and that is that you don't need to be a, an image stacking and processing wizard in order to get some nice shots with the Star Adventure amount. Now, of course, having these skills will help you get better results, but here's an example of what you can expect from just a single shot straight out of the camera with no editing. Then with a crop and a few simple tweaks in Photoshop, you can turn it into this. Now, this may not be the best Orion photo around, but it's still quite presentable. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more photography discussions.